Hello, everyone. I'm Hal Eisner. As the pandemic and our social isolation become just another fact of everyday reality, we're all starting to get a glimpse of the big changes we're facing and the changes that face those around us as well. Even if restrictions lighten up and more people can go back to work, the vast majority of our kids will be staying home and learning from home for months to come. Our pets are affected as well. What traumas do they face and how can we keep them protected? And our healthcare professionals facing fear and trauma every day. How do they manage to cope? We'll find out. Fox 11 News in depth starts right now. Hello everyone. What about those medical professionals? This crisis has been taxing for them, both physically and mentally. Joining us from Colorado Community Health in Colorado, actually it's called Boulder Community Health, emergency room doctor Shannon Sovendahl. Doctor, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Right now I'm feeling pretty good because I'm at home. Okay. Yeah, me too. You know, you've written this book about uh, the ER. It's called Fragile, Beauty and Chaos, Grace and Tragedy, and the Hope that Lives in Between. So let's focus in on that. Chaos, grace, and hope. Start with chaos. I would guess that what you're experiencing in the ERs in Colorado, very similar to maybe what we're experiencing here. Could you maybe try to give us some perspective? Well, I think that, yeah, you know, providers across the country are really experiencing the same thing. You know, a pandemic's not a normal thing for us. This isn't something we deal with on a regular basis. But that being said, first responders, ER providers, you know, the ER is an inherently dangerous place. There's a lot of disease that we can catch there. You know, there's other things out there like HIV, hepatitis, there's combative patients. So we're used to being in an environment where it's a little stressful, and that's just always the case for us. Obviously, when you add the pandemic, it becomes well, much more um, significant because we're just seeing a large number of patients. When we talk about grace and tragedy and the hope that lives in between, we have seen incredible videos of workers in hospitals from across the country dealing with the people that are sick, but also talking to us through smartphones and telling us about their experiences. What's this been like for the people that you've worked around? What has this been like for you? Well, I mean, it's it's stressful. You know, you go to work and you're worried about catching this disease. Uh, you're worried about bringing it home to your family. I have little ones at home. So I think a lot of people across the board are feeling feeling that. And then you add to it that, that, that there's a volume of patients, a lot of patients, and they can be very sick. So that adds to that chaos feeling that you're having where, you know, there's a lot of pressure going on. When I come home from work, essentially, you know, I'm exhausted. I, I just go to bed. And, and it's not just the physical part of the work. It's the mental part. It's wearing the PPE all day. And for me and a lot of people I work with, you know, when you come to work, you kind of get ready to go into that battle and you put on all your protective gear and I just wear it for the day. And I worry, you know, I'll hydrate when I get home or when I take this off. Um, but really, I'm just kind of encompassing myself in that gear for the whole shift. And it definitely takes a toll toll on you, uh, you know, after shift. We know, you know, people that work in the emergency room deal with all kinds of tragedy and, and, and just all kinds of situations. But this is a. Uh, it's like a tidal wave just coming through and bam, you know, person after person. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as, as emergency providers, we're used to seeing bad things. We see death and dying. That's part. That's partially why I wrote this book and why it's called Fragile is because, you know, life is fragile. And as you move forward and you see these things happen to patients in the ER, you can't help but reflect for your own life. You know, how does that make me feel now that I go home and trying to live a regular life? And then something like a pandemic happens and really it changes it from a, a experience that I'm having in the ER or an experience that our community is having or that people in the U.S. are having. It is everyone in the world is feeling this stress of you know, what does this disease mean to me? What are the likelihood that I can catch it or that I can become sick from it? Um, so all of that just, you know, adds to itself. And it is like a tidal wave. And the emotion can get out of control if you're not um, kind of ready for it. But, you know, part of my premise with this book is that all of those stresses that you have, it actually allows us to open up life. And that's that's what the title of the book is, meaning there's beauty and chaos and there's grace and tragedy. And really, that gives me hope. That gives me hope to go go to work. It gives me hope to move forward with my family and my wife. And so it's it's the full spectrum of all the stress in, that you have in your life and then what that brings you on the flip side. I heard from one of my colleagues who was at a hospital this past week that the things seem to be a little bit compartmentalized, that you have the COVID patients really in that ICU area and, and things like that. And then the rest of the hospital kind of almost not 
partitioned off, but sort of metaphorically partitioned off in order to separate these sort of issues. Do you, do you have that in Colorado? Is that what the situation is like in your hospital? No, I, I mean, really for us, and I think for, at a lot of facilities, it's, um, you know, you have to assume that everybody has COVID. That's kind of our operating plan right now, just because you don't know people are asymptomatic. And, you know, we've heard in the news that a large percentage of people don't show uh, symptoms. And so because of that, anybody that you're seeing in the hospital could have potential uh, virus that you can be exposed to. And so I think in our facility, RER, when you come in there, it is like one full unit, meaning we'll separate out if we have multiple uh, COVID type patients into an area, but the whole ER, everyone's walking around in protective equipment. Everyone's acting as if um, everyone has the disease. And really when you move through the hospital, even if you walk down the halls, you know, in our facility, we don't have any guests. We don't have anybody kind of from the outside in the hospital. It's just people working and everyone's wearing protective equipment. You know, when, when we think of a, a situation where we might go to the ER, uh, maybe in the middle of the night, uh, stomach pain or something else. Is it discouraged for people to, to do that given this other situation with COVID-19? No, I think what, you know, the ER still serves its purpose. We still are going on with our uh, life, which means people have heart attacks, people have appendicitis, people have broken bones. And that's what the ER is there for. And the ER is set up to take care of those patients still. We have a plan in place in order to still take care of patients that need the ER. I think the initial message that came out was, we want people to avoid the ER if, you know, it's something that a primary care physician could see, like say they need a medication refill that isn't urgent or, you know, something minor that's bothering them that maybe they could just talk to their primary care physician on the phone. In the U.S., we're used to using the ER for all types of things, not just serious uh, conditions. And really what we, we want people to focus on is if you need the ER presently, you're absolutely fine to come to the ER. We're still set up to take care of you. We have protective measures in place to take care of you. And we want you to be evaluated if you have a problem. We just don't want it to be, hey, I just was coming because I thought maybe I should be seen today. Well, hats off to you and all the people that are working on the front line and trying to deal with this very serious public health issue. We appreciate your time. And when we continue on Fox 11 News In Depth, We'll take a look at uh, something a little bit different. All of us that have kids, we know what it's like to deal with homeschooling. We know what it's like to have the kids home every single day. We're going to get some advice on how to deal with that. Be right back. Welcome back to Fox 11 News in Depth. I'm Hal Eisner. Let's talk about school right now. It's it's looking like the restrictions on most schools are going to last right on through the summer. Well, some parents may be a little fed up with that situation by now, even with their own kids. The frustration is real. It is something that's heartfelt. Uh, you know, there are people who are parents who feel that they weren't necessarily cut out for this sort of thing. And, and this kind of learning is very strange. You know, in the words of one first grader, it's just too weird. And, and maybe in a way it is. Donna Tetro is a parenting journalist, somebody I've known for a very long time. And, and Donna, I know you got a podcast. I think it's called Kids Under Construction. How are you and your family doing? Hi, Hal. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. We are getting through it. <laughs> um, you know, we're weeks into this now, and the fact that all of us now know here in California that we are going to be homeschooling through the remainder of the academic school year is, is a challenge. And I think a lot of people are feeling it, and I'm one of those moms there that's feeling it. I've got two boys, 11 and 12 years old, and the pain's real. It's it's all of us okay, have so, challenges. So even even the governor, excuse me, even the governor has talked about this. I want I want you to hear what the governor says, and on the other side of it, let's discuss. Okay. Is a, there is a, a a big distance between a parent teaching their child and a teacher teaching their child. Uh, it's not that our kids don't respect their parents. They just don't seem to respect them when it comes to educating them as much as they do their teachers. So if there was ever any. So, you know, when we talk about dealing with the pressures of, of just having isolation, and now we're talking about the pressures of dealing with homeschooling as well, talk about for a moment what that dynamic is all about and the kinds of things that might help parents get through this just a little bit better. 
Yeah, you know, what's interesting about this is before I was a journalist, I was a teacher. And so what he's talking about when he's talking about the fact that parents are not teachers, that is real. And what parents have to understand is that they have not been trained as teachers. So all they can do is the best that they can do. And what I would recommend to parents is if your school is sending work, try to keep up with what that work is. If your school is not, don't worry, take a breath and do some learning in different ways. There's all kinds of learning that can be going on. Cooking is learning. Reading is learning. Just regular reading is learning. And parents do understanding that it's okay to take it slow, especially if they have kids who are different ages, different abilities. Um, you also have to think about this digital divide. Not all families have access to computers. So Take that deep breath and start from the beginning. And what I like to say is routine. Start with a routine. What kinds of things are you hearing from parents are, that are particular frustrations that may have been unintended consequences, things that we really didn't expect to have happen? Well, I, I think there's a huge digital divide. That's the issue. I mean, literally, when I was coming on with you right now, I was trying to get logged in. My kid, my 12 year old kid had to help me get logged in and I've been doing this. So parents are having trouble with this distance learning and getting up to speed. So are the kids. And so there's this whole learning curve that we're going through. But what I'd like to say is once you've achieved something that was maybe difficult, there's a resilience build right there. We figured this out. We're a team. We're figuring this out. So there's learning in teamwork. There's learning in communication. And that's what I want parents to understand. They are at their wits end. I'm there too some days. And I used to be a teacher. So just be gentle with yourself and know that this is a learning process for all. You know, one piece of advice, if you can offer something up, I, I, in, a period, in a time like this, isolation is, is very important. Uh, but it's also very anxiety provoking. And so for parents who like, I need five minutes by myself, how do we deal with that with children? How, how do we say, you know what, I love you, but I've got to step away for a minute? Well, I love that question. I think it's really important. And I think one thing that families can do is sit down, have a family meeting and say, here's the new normal, guys. We're going to have a school day. And then we're going to have our regular mommy and daddy day at the end of that school day. And when I need time to work, that means that you have to respect those boundaries. Of course, this is, you know, this is not about toddlers or pre-K or, you know, K through two. They don't have that ability. But if you have older kids, try this with their, your kids. Ask them, can you help me? This allows kids some power in all of this, knowing that they can help and be a participant in this by helping mom and dad. So if mom needs a break, let mom have a break. If dad needs a break, also, if you've got two parents in the home, ask dad to take the kids out for the walk. Mom, you do some manicure or, or read a book or a, listen to a podcast and vice versa for dad. Work as a team. Well, Mom, I hope you've enjoyed this break and this opportunity to talk to me. And so I hope this I has have. been something uh, uh, good for you. <laughs> this has been awesome. Thanks so much for having me. All right. All right, Donna, thanks so much. And when Fox 11 News In-Depth in continues, how is the safer at home quarantine affecting our pets, local rescues? And when we get back to work, how will they deal with pet separation anxiety? We'll be right back. If there's one thing that makes being quarantined at home a little more comforting, it's having our furry friends around, our dogs, our cats, and other critters. In fact, some shelters are being cleaned out by people adopting a companion to help them get through these troubled times. But there are some unknowns about how this disease might affect a dog or cat, and I looked into some of the latest information. <laughs> Mobile veterinarian Dr. Patrick Mahaney is on a house call to give Dugan, a 12-year-old mix, his biweekly injection for osteoarthritis in his hip. 
To Mahaney, Dugan, and your pets, here are some of the pictures of them you sent to me over social media, are pretty unlikely to get sick from the coronavirus. But he says there's still too much we don't know about COVID-19. For instance, there were dogs in Hong Kong that lived with humans that were infected that themselves would test positive when their nasal or oral swabs were done. At this West Hollywood dog park where people were out with their pets, we saw a lot of people practicing good social distancing, but doing a lot of dog petting as well. Actually, the doctor doesn't think right now anyone should be going to a dog park at all. But could a person who's symptomatic or asymptomatic spread the virus to the coat of a dog or cat? And what about that tiger at the Bronx Zoo that tested positive for the coronavirus? Could our small cats get that? Cats, which could include your house cat, have receptors that better match the virus than dogs do, where the COVID-19 virus can bind and can actually cause sickness. Seemingly so far, dogs can't become sick, but that could change. We, we don't really know yet. And just let me point out here, it, it has changed a little bit here, here with regard to cats. A report this week, starting with TMZ, said that two cats, house cats, in New York tested positive. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But another amazing person that I've known a long time is Laura Nativo. And, and she's an animal trainer. She's worked with dogs on TV shows and movies like A Dog's Purpose. That's, I think that's where we first met. How are you doing? And how's that dog? I'm, do I'm doing well. I've got Penelope Superfly here with me. Um, we actually did a dog and pony show as her movie, so that's okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about let's talk about this quarantine and our pets. I, I know I for everybody. I have a dog. I have a cat. Cindy is the dog. Maeve is our kitty around here, and and they seem to have gotten used to all of us being here in the house. But there is going to be a time when when these two guys and others are going to go. Where would everybody go? So I want to get into that. But first, I really want your reaction to these two cats in New York that have tested positive for COVID-19. What, what is your reaction? You know, gosh, it's so overwhelming. I think there's so much information that's coming to us. And the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization have done such a good job trying to stay up to date. But the facts are constantly changing. And so I think it's, it's frightening, to be honest. Um, it's good to know that more information is coming. And I think all we can do is everything in our power to keep ourselves and our pets yeah, safe. But, but does that does that shock you? I mean, we, we do know from the veterinarian we just heard from that, that the big cats like that tiger at the Bronx Zoo have receptors to be able to get COVID-19. He speculated that maybe small cats could, too. And now we have two cases. I mean, it's 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 shocking and it's surprising. It's scary to think that our house pets, you know, may be able to transmit it. But I don't know if they've actually had an instance of the pets transmitting it to us yet. I know this is no, breaking I, news. I, no, I believe it's the other way around. I believe it's no, I believe it's a case of the positive owner transmitting it to the cat. The cat has a receptor that can receive it. But it, it, it obviously is shocking. Another thing we know, the Board of Supervisors this week took a position that it was very important to be able to have uh, two people to be able to take your trusted mm -hmm. pet if it turns out that that uh, they need to be taken from the home if, if, if something happens and you have to have documents, licenses, things to go along with that. So your dog doesn't end up or your cat doesn't end up in a pound. What, what What's your thought on that? Absolutely. It's so important. We always talk about creating a disaster plan for our pets and making sure that we have an emergency kit ready to go that has all of their health records, enough food, their collar, their leash, their identification tag. In the situation that we're dealing with this pandemic, I think it's very important that we contact friends and family members to try to find a volunteer who would be willing to step up in the event that something happened where you had to be hospitalized. So when we go back to work, there is a potential here for, and I think you and I have talked about this, pet anxiety, separation anxiety. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, so I think right now what's happening is our pets are living in a dream world. They don't know that there's a pandemic. They know that mom, dad, brother, sister, the entire family is home. And in some ways, it's really good. At the same time, we have to prepare our pets for what happens when everyone goes back to work. Um, we also, your last guest was talking about the challenges for parents who are trying to homeschool. People are trying to work from home. And so it's really important that we find ways to keep our pets busy and occupied and give them things to do during the day so that we can have peace, um, but also start focusing on what can we do to prepare our pets for that transition when hopefully we all get to go back to normal. 
But what what kinds of things are you talking about there that, that we can have prepared to do? Okay, so there's a few different things. We want to make sure that our pets are comfortable in our absence. And some ways that we can do that is by right now, rather than feeding them out of their bowl, we can think about taking mealtime and feeding them out of things like interactive feeders. There's different interactive toys that we can use where rather than putting their food in a bowl and they just gobble it up, we can feed them out of something that makes mealtime enriching and gives them something to do. We should do that away from ourselves. So if you're in the kitchen preparing a meal, maybe consider putting your pets in the bathroom or in a bedroom, some type of comfortable space. We also want to practice getting them ready for us leaving the house, making the act of us leaving the house something positive that they look forward to. So ways that we can do that is Think about the environmental cues before you go. You might pick up your keys. Maybe your wife picks up her purse. And we kind of gather things. We put our shoes, our jackets on before we leave the home. We can practice doing things like we put on our jacket and we toss a treat. Or we put on our clothes. We put some food into an interactive toy in another room. The other thing we can do is while our pets are home, practice taking time to go maybe read a book or do some work in your car take a walk without your pet. That way they start getting used to having your absence and give them something fun and positive to do. So you don't want them to be worried every time you walk out the door that, oh my gosh, where's Hal going? You want to give them something fun and positive. So I can show you like a fun little upcycled game we can play with things from around the house. We only have about 30 seconds. Do it quickly. 30 seconds. (laughs) All right. Sure. Okay. So, so right now we all have boxes because we're getting things delivered. We might have, if we're lucky, empty paper towel rolls. You can just take your dog's treats, quickly stuff them in a paper towel roll, fold the edges. And if you do this, think about your kids when they go on an Easter egg hunt, it becomes a fun scavenger game. So you can take things like toilet paper rolls, boxes, even bowls or plates and hide your pet's meal throughout the house. It creates a fun game that makes learning a lot, take a lot more time. So it gives your pet something fun to do. Lauren and Tebow, thank you so much for being with us. And we'll be back right after the break. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Hal. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We want to end on this very touching tribute to those amazing doctors and nurses. Hang in there, everybody. We're going to get through this. Bye-bye. You're broken down and tired Of living life on the merry-go-round And you can't find a fight I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out and move.